Good morning, everyone. Congratulations on making it through the first week of hastily put together virtual classes. Uh, hopefully this has been working out somewhat well from you. Of course, as always, if you're having trouble accessing uh, these videos, if these if they're not working well, if they're not uh, loading for you, uh, please, please send me an email and I'll uh, figure out a way to get you this content uh, in another in another way so that everyone has access to it. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the question of how we can, should rethink responsibility for climate change, looking at articles from Simon Caney and Robin Eckersley uh, that, that take two different approaches to rethinking the way that we should ascribe responsibility in this context. Uh, on the one hand, we're going to look at Caney's hybrid principle of distributing responsibility. Then we're also going to look at Eckersley's use of Iris Marion Young's social connections model to think about how that changes the way we think about responsibility. So if we sum up our kind of different ways of distributing responsibility from uh, Monday's class, we have two broad categories of principles. On the one hand, we have history sensitive principles. Uh, these are principles like the like grandfathering, the polluter pays principle, the beneficiary pays principle. And the idea here is that these history sensitive principles are going to be dependent on some sort of causal claim, that there's some sort of claim to about the history of greenhouse gas emissions. On the other hand, the ability to pay principle, the greatest guaranteed minimum principle, the equal burdens principle, all of these are blind to history, that they ascribe responsibility for taking action to fight climate change without regard to historical emissions. Now, um, each of these has a series of limitations. On the one hand, uh, if we're looking at history sensitive principles, there's questions of indirect causation, that climate change is not directly caused uh, by any one person's or agent's actions. Uh, climate uh, change is non-intentional form of harm. There's questions of intergenerational responsibility and also questions of global justice and the right for developing nations to develop their natural resources in ways that Western European and North American states did. These are all kind of intimated in the readings that we had from last class from Dale Jameson and Williamson and Armstrong. On the other hand, history blind principles also seem to suffer from limitations. Uh, they ignore causal contribution and responsibility, which seems to su which seem to be important, that there should be some link between obligation and historical uh, contribution. They also seem to justify past injustices, right? That they don't look at why, how we got to the situation where some countries are able to pay, have a greater ability to pay, or why the, why this guaranteed minimum isn't already been met. It just kind of says, nope, we're going to ignore that and look forward towards the future. Caney also, in his article, introduces the problem of non-compliance. And he writes, what, if anything, should be done if primary duty bearers do not perform their duties? In light of the havoc it wreaks on people's lives, we cannot accept a situation in which there are widespread enormously harmful effects on the vulnerable. In light of this, we have reason to accept a second option, one in which we assign secondary duty bearers. Uh, so what are we going to do if not everyone complies with the principle, like the polluter pays principle or the ability to pay principle? We also need to assign duties to someone else to enforce these primary duties, these primary responsibilities. So in light of all of these challenges, Simon Caney develops uh, a hybrid theory of responsibility that tries to integrate three different principles, an equal right to emit principle, a prince of the polluter pays, a modified polluter pays principle, and an ability to pay principle. And he argues that we need to kind of integrate these different theory, these different principles to develop a more robust theory of responsibility. So let's look at his starting place. He starts from the argument that we have to look at questions of rights and justice rather than the question of distributing duties. So he says, first, our, his starting point is that persons have a right not to suffer from the disadvantages generated by global climate change. That we need to have an understanding of what the question of justice is. Um, and then this claim about that we have a human right not to suffer from climate change is going to guide the way that we adopt distributive principles. Rather than saying that, like we, rather than saying that the distributive principle comes first, right, a principle of, of historical responsibility or of ability to pay, uh, and then and all things following from there. He thinks that we should adopt different distributive principles that are going to best uphold the right to not suffer the ill effects of climate change. So from this, he derives four duties. 
Uh, and the first, and I'm, I'm not going to work through all of the arguments that he gives about this. I'm just going to kind of summarize his, his, his conclusions here. First is that all have a duty not to emit greenhouse gases in excess of their quota. That all of us have a certain right to emit greenhouse gases up to a point where it violates another person's right not to suffer climate related hazards. And this is going to guarantee that developing countries can still emit greenhouse gases, um, but that we have to have a fair quota. Uh, and this is going to be based on a kind of an equal emissions rights that everyone has a right to a certain level of emit emissions. Now, the challenge, of course, as Caney admits and doesn't really resolve, is determining what a fair quota is. Um, is this going to be equal emissions rights? Is this everyone going to get, everyone gets, we take the remaining carbon budget and we divide it up among the 7 billion people on Earth? Or are we going to adjust these emission rights based on socioeconomic status and, and, global, and concerns of global justice? Keeney doesn't really resolve this question in this article. In other pieces, he opts more towards this fair emissions rights um, question rather than just equal shares of uh, in a, emission rights. Uh, I'm happy to share those articles with you if this is something of interest to you. The second principle that Keeney uh, derives is that those who exceed their quota or have exceeded it since 1990, that they have a duty to compensate others through mitigate through bearing additional mitigation or adaptation costs. And he calls this a revised version of the polluter pays principle that adapts it in order to respond to concerns about intention and intergenerational responsibility. He says that by 1990, you can't claim reasonable ignorance about climate change. Um, that prior to that, sure, you, there was reasonable ignorance, but in 1990, the foundation of the IPCC, um, it's uh, the first Rio Earth Summit, that you have no law, you can't use this as an excuse anymore to justify your inaction. And therefore, if you've exceeded your quota since 1990, you have a duty to, to bear additional mitigation or adaptation costs through a polluter pays principle. The third principle is that in light of one, two, and three, one being the problem of previous generations, two being the problem of excusable ignorance, and three, uh, polluters who cannot be made to pay, whether from unwillingness or whether from uh, whether these people are from uh, um, impoverished countries, that in light of these concerns, that the most advantaged have a duty to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in proportion to the harm resulting from excusable ignorance polluters who cannot be made to pay in previous generations uh, through either mitigation or to address the ill effects of climate change through adaptation, right? That there's going to be some amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are not captured by D2, right? By this polluter pays principle that emissions from, from before 1990, um, some amounts of reasonable ignorance and well as, as the, uh, the global poor uh, who, who cannot reasonably be made, made to, should not reasonably be made to pay Therefore, the wealthiest and most advantaged have an advantage, have an obligation uh, to take bear even more costs. Uh, and so that these harms created are going to be addressed by the virtue of the ability to pay principle. And finally, uh, he turns to the question of enforcement, that the most advantaged have a duty to construct institutions that discourage future noncompliance. Uh, that the wealthiest, uh, the most advantaged have to have to bear the costs necessary to create institutions that can impose costs and secure collective action. Um, and then these costs are going to be allocated according to the ability to pay principle to build these types of enforcement institutions to ensure that um, to ensure that principles one, two, and three can go can be enforced. And so we get a, a, a theory of responsibility that looks a little bit like this. That on the one hand, we each are set a certain quota. If we exceed our quota, we can we should be punished for and to deal with the other um, emissions and ill effects of climate change that we have that, that we should distribute these remain residual duties according to the ability to pay principle, and we should distribute the duty to construct institutions to discourage noncompliance according to the ability to pay principle. So we have kind of different moving parts: an equal rights principle, a polluter pays principle, and an ability to pay principle, all working together to resolve different questions. And the idea here is that there's no one principle that can solve all of the problems associated with climate change. So instead, we need to um, integrate multiple principles to address different concerns. So the question then is like, how is this unique or different from the others we've discussed? On the one hand, 
it's still like every other principle that we've talked about ascribes greater duties to the most advantaged. However, it does so for different normative reasons. So in practice, it probably looks pretty much the same, uh, but in, in theory, it has a different set of justifications. It also focuses on affluent persons, not affluent countries. Um, it ha and we'll talk about this in just a second. And it takes seriously the question of non-compliance in a way that our other theories of responsibility didn't really talk about kind of political institutions. Uh, and so this does kind of, it both adds a bit of theoretical clarity and maybe gives us a more realistic picture. But it does raise this question that Caney engages at the in the conclusion of this essay between methodological individualism and methodological collectivism. So um, is the primary um, duty bearer, is the primary polluter, is the primary beneficiary an individual? Or, in, or a collective, like what is the fundamental unit that this theory applies to? And if we look at all of these questions, methodological individualism is plagued with a series of challenges. On the one hand, if we're talking about who the relevant polluters are, um, we've already talked about the non-identity problems, the intergenerational challenges, uh, figuring out who the relevant polluters are. So it might make sense to say that collectives, so the United States or Germany or Japan, um, that last over time, even as individual citizens of these countries pass on, um, that they are the relevant polluters, but uh, rather than looking at individuals. Similarly, if we're looking at the questions of beneficiaries, um, a collectivist approach, looking at uh, societies or communities or collective groups as the relevant uh, agent, avoids a non-identity problem because we're not looking at this question of individual identity. And if we look at the right to omit, uh, we can also, uh, we, uh, the methodological individualism also uh, asserts that it might it might be unjust to impose costs on current generations because of the actions of previous members of their state. So why should some like just be in the same reason that you don't determine where you are born, you don't determine when you are born. And, and an individualist approach might argue that it is unfair to hold me to uh, bear the costs and pay the pay for the the misdeeds of previous generations. So in all three of these respects, a collectivist approach seems to be uh, preferred, but can use for an individualist approach. And he argues that the relevant duty bearers, the relevant polluters, the relevant beneficiaries, the relevant rights bearers uh, should be individuals, not states. Uh, he doesn't really give a lot of reasoning and justification for that, but it's a good pivot for us to turn to Eckersley uh, and to think about a different way of framing the question of responsibility away from cost-benefit analysis. So if you need to take a pause, you need to take a break, pause this video, this is a good place to do, that, do so, and then we're going to turn to Eckersley for a few minutes. So Robin Eckersley, in this chap chapter that you read today, argues that the dominant frame for thinking about environmental problems comes from economics. So we look at pollution as a negative externality, which are the unintended and unwanted side effects of normal practices of production and consumption. Uh, and she argues that this framing serves to naturalize the practice of privatizing gains and socializing losses, and thereby absolves economic agents of responsibility until such time as regulators step in or third party victims turn to litigation. And so when we think about responsibility and we think about climate change, Eckersley is arguing that we need to think about this as a political concept, not an economic one. That is, it's about making public claims and demands, not about changing private behavior, and not about kind of a cost-benefit analysis. The, the question of responsibility is much less about redistributing particular costs to particular individuals, and more about how we are going to reform the structure of the political world. And so she draws on Iris Young's theory of political responsibility that we read a few weeks ago, uh, the social connections model. And this is the idea that we are responsible for not only the things we directly do, but for transforming unjust structures that we participate in and benefit from. Climate change is clearly a sense of a structural injustice, and it involves a global structure of production and consumption that promotes fossil fuel use and unevenly distributes the benefits and costs of such activity. And so, according to this theory, those of us who benefit from the system have a responsibility to take political action to transform the system. 
So if we remember from Young, there's four dimensions here. Um, it's not isolating. The social connections model does not ascribe responsibility solely to particular individuals. Um, it, it evaluates existing rules and institutions. It doesn't just look at when people break the law. It looks to see whether the laws and institutions and practices and cultures are themselves just. It's more concerned about what we are going to do forward looking rather than assigning blame backwards looking. And this is a shared responsibility, but the shared responsibility is not divided equally. Eckersley also adds three kind of key concepts for her account of, of, of her development of Young's theory, that when we're taking political responsibility, it involves answering, acknowledging, and solidarity. So it requires that we actually answer for uh, or respond to the injustice, that we have to answer for the, the things that we've done, the things that are done in our name, the things that we benefit from, and actually like take ownership of them. That we have to acknowledge our social connections that tie people together beyond nation, national borders or beyond the direct effects of our individual actions. And it requires a strong sense of solidarity that's not easy to, to come by. It doesn't just come from nothing. For us to actually share responsibility in common, we actually have to have a sense of solidarity. We have to really care for one another. And so these three kind of characteristics or virtues are necessary, according to Eckersley, for taking responsibility in a political sense. And Eckersley argues that Jung's theory uh, gives us a way to think about um, our political responsibility to fight climate change from the perspective of both citizens and states. So on the one hand, for citizens, it encourages that, that we should prioritize civic engagement and political action over private action. Like here, the idea is that our goal to fight our, our actions to fight climate change should focus on um, changing political institutions, changing laws, uh, lobbying for collective political action rather than just sim rather than simply um, trying to reduce our own carbon footprint by ourselves. It's kind of a similar to Senator Armstrong's argument that. Um, but, it, but there's still a responsibility for citizens to, crack, to kind of force governments to take this action. And so Eckersley summarizes that for citizens, we should exercise our political responsibility by using our memberships of organizations, our roles in the workforce and society, and whatever other capabilities of consumers to drive the necessary structural transformation to a low carbon sustainable society. And so this is key because this idea is that we can take political responsibility not just by voting or writing to Congress people, but also by ex by ex using our memberships and organizations, our, our our connections within our universities and our jobs and our social connections. That can take the form of advocating for divestment at colleges and universities, for more sustainable initiatives at companies, uh, for for community solar and uh, community guard base and community solar power in our communities. This this is all for Eckersley and for young political organizing. At the level of states, Eckersley argues that the social connections model shows the limits of the polluter pays principle and carbon debt arguments, that it's not enough just to look backwards and assign blame, but we have to look forwards of how we are actually going to respond as an international community to climate change. This puts a bigger emphasis on global structures, that we have to look at how global finance is set up, the global distribution of trade networks, how, um, how highly polluting and carbon intensive industries are moved from wealthier countries to poorer countries. Uh, and then we have to look at these global political and economic structures and see where they can be reformed. Finally, Eckersley admits, and I think Jung does too, when you put, if you push her on it, that this doesn't mean that we should get rid of liability. The individual people who do bad things should still be punished, right? That we should maybe still have a carbon tax on uh, private jet owners, private jet usages, that we might still want to hold fossil fuel executives responsible for misleading the public about, um, about climate change and trying to discredit climate science, that all of those things can still happen within a broader framework of political responsibility. But this bigger and more capacious sense of responsibility has some challenges. And, and Eckersley talks about the vertigo of political responsibility because she's ultimately saying that we have to take our responsibility for the entire world. And this can be fairly overwhelming and even disempowering. So we have to find strategies to overcome this vertigo. Um, and Eckersley doesn't really give us the right answer. Other scholars such as Jade Schiff, uh, such as, um, Patchen and Markel have looked to the, the 
theory of acknowledgement and responsiveness that we have to cultivate a certain sense of responsibility and sense of solidarity with others. Um, but this is a challenge and, and actually saying that like this is not something that we can just flip a switch on overnight to overcome this vertigo. There's also the question of historical responsibility. So on the one hand, um, moving beyond guilt and blame might be beneficial. Right. It might be beneficial to say, like, we're going to not look, try to blame individuals for their past behavior, especially when we're talking about international climate negotiations. But at the same time, if we're interested in questions of justice, we want to figure out why there's such an inequality in emissions and vulnerability and adaptation capacity. And therefore, we can't completely sideline this question of historical responsibility. And Eckersley kind of leaves us in the conclusion of this chapter with like, we have to figure out how we're going to balance these two uh, commitments. She, right, because historical responsibility is politically confronting but background and backgrounding these principles can remove obstacles to that agreement, but backgrounding can also leave intact social structures that generate a widening of the gulf between those who enjoy the benefits and those who suffer the burdens produced by our global risk society. So this is the balancing act that we have to play. Eckersley concludes by saying that political responsibility means asking critical questions and being answerable to others in the sense of revealing, explaining, and justifying what has been done and not done while well, one wishes to get done by way of collective action and doing so publicly. Herein lies the surest path away from organized irresponsibility and the awful prospect of catastrophic climate change. So my question for you uh, uh, to think about is, is this a satisfying challenge or replacement to distributive principles, or is this just a way of dressing up the same things that the distributive principles have already kind of said? Next class, uh, for next week, next Monday, we're going to turn to uh, a critique of climate justice from Cass Sunstein and Eric Posner. And they argue that rather than trying to integrate climate concerns of climate change and questions of global justice and trying to fight both at the same time, that we should separate these two questions into two distinct questions, two distinct policy challenges. Uh, so that's going to be the reading assignment for next week, for next Monday. And the discussion post, the last uh, discussion question for, for this week, as a reminder, again, the, the format has changed since uh, the original. Um, for any of the discussion posts for that week, um, you, you just have to post one 200 word post to any of the discussion threads by Friday, uh, 327 at midnight. And by Sunday at midnight, you have to reply to one of your peers posts with a 100 word reply. Uh, again, you can write to any of the discussion on any of the discussion threads that have been posted for this week. So today's post it, question is, what do you think is the biggest challenge of institutionalizing either Caney's hybrid theory or Eckersley's use of the Young's social connection model in public policy responses to climate change? How, if at all, can this challenge be overcome? So how what would be the biggest challenge to actually implementing one of these theories in public policy? So thanks for tuning in. Uh, that's this week's, that concludes this week's unit on questions of responsibility and climate change. Uh, next week, we're actually going to move from less, from more theoretical thinking about this question to more practical questions. So some critiques of this uh, ideal theory, um, strategies for implementing emissions reductions, and talking about the actual political history of climate negotiations uh, and how and where and, and where, where these principles have contributed and where they haven't. Again, I hope this was uh, valuable and useful for you. Let me know if you have any questions. Stop into the discussion section. Stop by office hours. Shoot me an email. Um, if you're having any trouble accessing the material or if you have any questions about the material, don't hesitate to reach out. Have a good weekend. Take care. Stay safe. And I'll see you next time.